book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 18. Paul the Apostle writes, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. For since the creation of the world, literally the cosmos there, the universe, his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Not partly seen, not cloudily seen, but clearly seen. How? Being understood by the things that are made. Even is eternal power and Godhead so that they are without excuse. Paul the Apostle says that when you look at the things that are made, the evidence is so overwhelming, so powerful when you look at creation that the existence of God is obvious. So much so that we are without excuse. Now as a man, I'm very skeptical. I've always been a prove it to me kind of a guy. I needed evidence. I need, needed proof for the existence of God. Now ladies... They're not that way. Most ladies, they just push out a baby and they go, yep, there's a God. No doubt about it. No way that happened by chance. But I was a skeptic. I needed evidence. And so God gradually over the years gave me powerful evidence we're going to look at this morning that convinced me indeed that there was a creator. But Paul not only says that the existence of God is evident, looking at the things that are made. But Paul says, when you look at the things that are made, the nature of the universe, the nature of life forms, Paul says that you can actually clearly discern God's attributes, God's nature, or what I like to refer to as the resume of God. That all mankind can look at the things that are made and actually make reasonable, logical statements about the resume, the nature, the attributes of God. Now, I had an opportunity recently to put this to the test. I was invited to speak at a major university in Southern California. I got a phone call from the uh, director of the campus Bible study groups. Several hundred students attending this university were Christians. They um, passed out flyers all around the campus to all the students, and they passed out flyers to the professor's uh, mailbox, announcing the study that this doctor was going to come do called The Mystery of Life's Origin, The Great Debate. Now, on the flyer, there was no indication that it was going to be a Christian talk. So I get there, and as I'm setting up, the guy that was the organizer of the conference says, you're not going to believe it. There's a whole bunch of atheist professors here. And I said, all right, we're going to have fun today. We're going to use Paul's principle today to see if these professors can see what Paul said that they should see. So, first of all, we talked about the... Um, the DNA molecule. The DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, was discovered by Francis Crick and James Watson in 1953 and made famous in 1994 by O.J. Simpson, of course. <laughs> the DNA molecule, deoxyribonucleic acid, consists of two strands of nucleotides, the building blocks of DNA. These nucleotides are bonded together in long chains, and they take two of these chains, chains and uh, bond them together and then twist them like a ladder being twisted on itself. And it creates what's called the double spiral helix, deoxyribonucleic acid. The DNA molecule is an incredibly complex three-dimensional molecule made of building blocks called nucleotides that I pointed out to the students that the biochemists in this university, using the elements of the ground and the presumed conditions that existed on the early earth, according to evolutionists, that using today's biochemical expertise, today's biochemists cannot even create the building blocks of DNA. Now, this DNA molecule carries a information storage system called the genetic code, which codes for the production of all of the structures and all of the functions in living systems. I pointed out some of the details to the students about the nature of the structure of the DNA molecule. And I said, I want you to go to the biology department and ask the biologist, where did this molecule come from that is so complicated that it cannot even today be synthesized by biochemists using today's biochemical know-how? Ask them, where did the molecule come from? And they will tell you, well, this molecule, you see, it evolved by chance. Billions of years of undirected 
chemical collisions over billions of years caused this DNA molecule to arise. In effect, it evolved from the primordial goo through the zoo to you over three and a half billion years. <laughs> it's basically an accident. So the chemistry department in this university says it's so complicated that we can't even synthesize this molecule, and the biology department says that it's just an accident. Well, Sir Frederick Hoyle is an um, astronomer and mathematician from Britain. He is uh, an agnostic. He was knighted by the Queen of England for his work in astronomy. And he studied back in the 1980s the nature of living systems and the nature of the genetic code. And in the journal Nature, November 12, 1981, Sir Frederick Hoyle said this, the chance that higher life forms might have emerged this way, that is, by chance, is comparable with the chance that a tornado sweeping through a junkyard could assemble a Boeing 747 from the material therein. <laughs> it isn't going to happen. Chance is never going to produce the complex molecules that we see in living systems. Next, I talked about the genetic code with the students. I pointed out that the genetic code is, first of all, a digital code. This genetic code, which is carried by the DNA molecule, it codes for the instructions, it possesses the instructions to produce all of the structures and control all of the functions in all living systems, that this genetic code is, first of all, a digital code. It's expressible, that is, in mathematical terms. Next, genetic code is error correcting. When a DNA molecule makes a copy of itself and it produces two daughter molecules, there are two proteins for you students, DNA polymerase two and three, that go along and feel the newly produced daughter molecule. If it finds an incorrectly placed building block, it pulls it out and puts the correct one in. So it's a digital, error-correcting information storage and retrieval system. Next, the genetic code is redundant. There are segments of DNA which are so important that they occur in more than one place in the genetic code. So that if one of these genes, these segments of DNA, develops an error, that particular gene is turned off and the backup gene is turned on. So it's a redundant, error-correcting digital information storage and retrieval system. And finally, the information is overlapping. There are segments of DNA which can code for the production of more than one protein and therefore code for the production of more than one structure or more than one function in living systems. Let me give you an example. Imagine a, um, an English sentence, a hundred letters long. You put the spaces in a predetermined place and it spells out a sentence. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water and on and on. You then take those letters and you squish them together, get rid of the spaces, and then you put the spaces in the same sequence of letters in a different place and you get an entirely different sentence. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and the earth was without form and void and on and on. All of that from the same sequence of letters. That is an amazing sentence. Try writing a sentence like that. It's probably impossible to do it a hundred letters long. Now, that's the nature of the genetic code. So, the genetic code is an overlapping, redundant, error-correcting, digital information storage and retrieval system. I gave many examples of this, and I said to the students, well, let me, let's talk about the nature of information. Let's go to the next slide. There we go. Dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, dot, dot. Everybody in the room can see the order this unlikely sequence of dots and dashes. But not everybody is their information conveyed when you see the dots and dashes. In order for information to be conveyed, you have to have a knowledge of a thing called the Morse code. The Morse code is a language convention that consists of arbitrary, that is, man-made rules that determine the meaning of sequences of dots and dashes. So it's an arbitrary, that is man-made, language system that conveys information when you see dots and dashes. If you have a knowledge of the Morse code, you see that dot, 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 dash, 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 dot, 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 means S-O-S, save our souls. Help! Right? So information is only conveyed, everybody sees the order, but information is only conveyed when there is a language system which you use to interpret the sequences involved. Now, 
Information can be stored on just about anything you want to store it with. You can store information with beads on a string, knots on a rope, iron atoms on a floppy disk, the sounds of one's voice. Information can be carried by just about anything. But information is only perceived when there is a set of rules and regulations devised in a language convention by which you interpret the sequences of whatever you're using to store your information. Let's say we want to invent a new language. And we decide that UG means I'll meet you at the malt shop. And we decide that NUG means okay, I'll be there. And LUG means I'm buying. And you and I are in a big room like this. It's packed with people and I'm standing over here and I stand up and I say, UG. Now everybody in the room thinks that I'm in pain or choking. Except for you. You're standing over here and you stand up and you say, UG. We're going to the malt shop and I'll meet you there. And then I stand up and I say, UG. And you get a big smile on your face and we both go out the back door because you know we're going to the malt shop and Mark is buying. <laughs> everybody else in the room is going, What's wrong with those two knuckleheads? What's the difference? The difference is, is that you and I possess a knowledge of a preconceived language convention, a set of rules and regulations which you use to interpret the sequences. You know, there are cultures in South America that to this day use knots on ropes to convey information. Hubby comes home at night, there's all these strings hanging from the door. Johnny needs a new pair of shoes. Betty scraped her knee. And my wife's pregnant with her fifth child. What? All with knots on a rope. So just about anything can carry information, but information only exists or is conveyed when there is a language convention. Now, I pointed out many examples of this to the students at this university. And I pointed out that if you go to the information sciences department, the computer sciences department, where they keep the computer nerds, and you go to the computer science department and you ask them, where do digital, error correcting, redundant, overlapping information storage and retrieval systems come from? They will tell you that they only come from a mind. The chance, combining of anything, that chance is the antipole of information. When a computer scientist tries to write information, or tries to write a code or a language, they do everything they can to make sure that chance plays no role in the development of the code or the program. That's why we need computer scientists. If chance could produce codes and programs and language conventions, all we'd have to do is blindfold three-year-olds, stick them in front of a computer, let them tap away, and they could type Microsoft Word 2004 or something, right? But it doesn't happen that way. You need a mind to produce information. Information is the opposite of chance. So I told the students, I said, I want you to leave the information science department, go to the biology department, ask the biologists, where did this error correcting digital, redundant, overlapping information storage and retrieval system come from? And they'll tell you that it was just an accident. Billions of years of undirected, meaningless molecular collisions produced not only the DNA molecule, but the language convention that is carried by the DNA molecule. It's an accident. Now, Sir Frederick Hoyle, again, our British astronomer and mathematician, after examining carefully the nature of the genetic code and living systems, said this. He said, the notion that not only the biopolymers, that is the DNA molecules and the proteins of living systems, but the operating program of a living cell could be arrived at by chance in a primordial soup here on Earth is evidently nonsense of a high order. Quite a few of my astronomical friends are considerable mathematicians. And once they become interested enough to calculate for themselves, instead of relying on hearsay argument, they can quickly see this point. Sir Frederick Hoyle, New Scientist, Volume 92, page 1280. So information, codes, programs, highly complex molecules must be the result of a mind. There's an organization called SETI, S-E-T-I, the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. I went to their website a couple of days ago, and this organization uses radio telescopes. They face these radio telescopes to the sky, to the heavens, and they're looking, they tell us, for evidence of intelligence in outer space. 
When you read the website, there's questions that they answer. How will you know when you have found evidence of intelligence? They say that they will know that they have found evidence of an intelligence signal when they find a digital, non-random, repeating sequence found in the radio waves. The signal is analyzed, determined to see if it's non-random, make sure it's not just noise, and if it's determined to be a digital, non-random, repeating sequence, then they claim that they have found evidence of intelligence. You know what? That's what the genetic code is. Non-random signals. And yet, on the same webpage, the SETI webpage, they claim that their goal is to teach and show the people of the world that since the DNA molecule and life on Earth arose by chance, that it's likely that it arose also by chance out in outer space. So the same scientists that are looking for signals from space don't see that the DNA molecule is the very signal, the type of signal that they're looking for. What an incredible irony. Next, I went on to, with the university students, to discuss the nature of living systems in regards to comparing them to machines. According to Jacques Manaud, Harvard University biologist who won the Nobel Prize in biology, a machine is a purposeful collection of matter that uses energy to perform work. It turns out that living systems fulfill this definition of a machine all the way down to the molecular level, all the way down to the level of the enzymes, which are the proteins in your body that accomplish most of your important chemical reactions. We fulfill the definition of a machine. Proteins are aggregate of matter that use energy to perform the work of chemical reactions. Enzymes are involved in sight, hearing, taste, touch, smell, digestion. I have several trillion proteins right now in my stomach digesting hash browns and an egg right now. So enzymes are aggregates of matter that use energy to perform work, and there they, therefore they fulfill the definition of a machine. All the way down to the molecular level, living systems fulfill this definition. Well, let's look at some examples. This is the big brown bat called Eptysicus fuscus. Last year, scientists from the National Academy for the Advancement of Sciences published a paper in which they examined the sonar that is produced by this bat. They found that this bat can produce overlapping echoes. These bats, they send out a chirp. The chirp goes out, bounces off of objects, comes back to the bat's ear, the sound goes to the brain, and the bat calculates at the current temperature and the current atmospheric pressure, which affect the sound waves, the distance of an object that's either still or in motion. So this bat can process overlapping echoes arriving just two millionths of a second apart and distinguish between objects that are 0.3 millimeters apart. That's about the thickness of three human hairs. And the scientist Alan Grinnell from uh, UCLA, the neuroscientist, said that that is something which seems intuitively impossible. But yet bats do it. It's an incredibly complex machine for the casting out and the interpreting of sound information. James Simmons, the neuroscientist at Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, said that this bat sonar is three times as sharp as human-made sonar. Billions of years of random chance produced this sonar system? Incredibly complex machine? I don't think so. Let's talk about the visual system. The visual system is an incredibly complex machine-like system that converts photons, light, into electrons in the back of the retina using thousands of different types of enzymes. The electrons are sent down a wire called your optic nerve to the back of your brain where the image, which is upside down on the back of your retina, is made right side up in the back of your brain. The image is then sent from the back of your brain, your occipital cortex, to your frontal lobes where pattern recognition occurs, and your brain says, there's a car coming. You better move or you're going to die. Okay? And it does it trillions of these calculations in a fraction of a second, up to, some scientists say, up to 60 frames per second. Now, let's read what John Stevens wrote in Byte magazine. He is a computer scientist. He said this. He said, while today's digital hardware is extremely impressive, it is clear that the human retina's real-time performance goes unchallenged. 
actually to simulate 10 milliseconds or one one hundredth of a second of the complete processing of even a single nerve cell from the retina would require the solution of about 500 simultaneous, simultaneous nonlinear differential equations 100 times. So 50,000 calculus integral equations done in one one hundredth of a second to simulate what occurs in one retinal cell. He goes on. He says, and it would take at least several minutes of processing time on a Cray supercomputer. Keeping in mind that there are 10 million or more such cells interacting with each other in complex ways, it would take a minimum of 100 years of Cray time to simulate what takes place in your eye many times every second. No wonder your eyes are so tired at the end of the day. You've been doing trillions and trillions of integral calculus problems all day long, even if you've never had a class in calculus. So it take, in 1985, he wrote this article, Reverse Engineering the Brain in Byte Magazine. He said that it would take 100 years for a crazy supercomputer to, take, to uh, simulate what happens in your eye many times every second. Well, computers are a lot faster now, maybe 20 times faster than 1985. So now it would only take two years for a crazy supercomputer to, you know, uh, simulate what happens in your eye many times every second. Unbelievable. Consider the human brain. The average adult human brain weighs about 3.5 pounds and has the consistency of a meatloaf, roughly. The human brain calculates in equivalent to what are called petaflops, which is billions times billions of floating point operations per second. The human brain calculates billions of times faster than the fastest computer chips made by man. And I read one scientist who said that one human brain has more electrical connections, they're called synapses, than all of the electrical connections in all of the electronic appliances ever made by man. One human brain. It operates at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit and it runs on potatoes. <laughs> I did this talk at Raul Reese's church a few months ago and I didn't get a very big reaction from that joke and I said, or chimichangas or burritos and they all went, oh yeah, dude, chimichangas, I get it, yeah, cool, yeah. <laughs> I read one scientist who said, that if we could make a computer that could run as fast as a human brain with today's silicone-based technology, if we plugged it in, it would use the energy of the city of Las Vegas at nighttime, and it would run so hot it would burn a hole in the ground 50 feet deep. And yet there you sit this morning with your 3.5-pound meatloaf brains <laughs> doing petaflops at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and your head is not on fire. Un. Believable. Now, the brain is a machine. It's an aggregate of matter that uses the energy from potatoes to perform the work of orchestrating your metabolic functions. The brain is a computer, an unbelievable computer. Michael Denton is an evolutionist who wrote a book in 1985 called Evolution, A Theory in Crisis. And he described what a living cell is like. He said... Although the tiniest bacterial cells are incredibly small, weighing less than 10 to the minus 12 grams, each is in effect a veritable micro-miniaturized factory containing thousands of exquisitely designed pieces of intricate molecular machinery made up altogether of 100,000 million atoms, far more complicated than any machine built by man and absolutely without parallel in the non-living world. He says that living cells are made up of billions of little machines, the enzymes, the structures that are machine-like structures, that it's more complicated than any machine ever made by man. So when you step on a bug this afternoon on a sidewalk, you've just wiped out a machine more complicated than a space shuttle or a crazy supercomputer. A single bacteria more complicated than a crazy supercomputer or an aircraft carrier. I read one scientist that said that a single amoeba, pond scum, is more complicated than the city of Manhattan Island. Unbelievable complexity. Another principle of engineering is the principle of miniaturization. I have a palm computer that I use for my uh, appointments and contacts and also my medical practice. This little computer 
palm-held computer has more calculating power than the Defense Department computers, which took up two floors of the Defense Department in 1950. Miniaturization is a sign of increasing intelligence manifested in increased efficiency of the use of information. How about micro-miniaturization? How about a machine more complicated than an aircraft carrier? A million of them can fit on the head of a pin. That's an evidence, according to the principles of engineering, of vast intelligence to create such a thing. So I presented to these students at this university multiple examples of the machine-like structure of living systems. And I told the students, I said, I want you to go to the biology department. I want you to ask them, where did these incredibly complex, super micro-miniaturized, information-packed machines come from? And the biology department will tell you, well, they arose by chance, you see. Billions of years of meaningless, undirected molecular collisions produced super machines that are far more complex than any machine made by man. I said, students, I want you to say thank you very much, leave the biology department, go across, across campus to the engineering department, and ask the engineers, where do machines come from? And they will tell you that all machines begin as a concept. Where do concepts come from? They come from a mind. Chance will never produce a machine. Chance, it turns out, is destructive to machines. Now, machines begin as a concept. I was driving down the street several months ago, and I heard an, ad, heard an ad on the radio for the Sharper Image Company for their new world's best Turbo 2000 nose hair trimmer. <laughs> the world's best nose hair trimmer, mind you. And I thought, what do I need a turbo nose hair trimmer for? <laughs> I mean, you turn it on turbo, and what if it goes, <laughs> take your head off, you know? A turbo nose hair trimmer. Now, the question is, it's a machine, it's an aggregate of matter that uses energy to perform the work of removing your nose hairs. Okay, where did the Turbo 2000 begin? It began first as a concept in the mind of somebody with way too much time on their hands, obviously. <laughs> somebody sitting down one day, I'm going to invent the world's best uh, nose hair trimmer, that's right. They applied the concept to paper and ultimately you apply the concept to matter. That's how you make a machine. So I spent about an hour and a half with these students at the university presenting these things. And I said that looking at the principles of chemistry, the, the principles of information theory, and the principles of engineering all imply that living systems are the result of a concept, the result of a mind. And one of the scientists who was sitting in the back was quite agitated because I was pitting the engineering department, the information science department, and the chemistry department. I was pitting them against the biologist. And this guy was a biologist. He was ticked. He stood up and he said, I am a scientist. Unless I can see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it, or detect it with my scientific instrumentation, I cannot believe that it exists, and therefore I cannot believe that your God exists. Now, I love it when they say that. And you should, too. There's a man by the name of Alvin Plantinga, a Christian philosopher, who said that proving the existence of God is like proving the existence of someone else's mind. You see, the thing about the mind is it's immaterial. I cannot see it, taste it, touch it, smell it, hear it, or detect it with scientific instrumentation. When I attach an electroencephalogram to your brain, and I measure your brain waves. I'm not measuring your mind. I'm measuring the flow of sodium and potassium and hydrogen atoms across a cell membrane, which generates an electrical charge. The mind is immaterial. It's non-physical. It's not detectable. The mind is the non-physical software or the driver behind your carcass that makes your carcass do what it does. The mind is not detectable. Now, or carci, plural. <laughs> <laughs> Uh. The mind cannot be detected with scientific principles. It cannot be detected by instrumentation. And Plantinga says the same thing is with God. You can't see God, taste, smell, touch, detect God with instrumentation. But when we look at the things that are made, we can see that the fingerprints of God are everywhere. Now, I looked at this professor and I said, Professor, based on the principle of your objection, I'm not permitted to believe that you have a mind. <laughs> he didn't like that. 
He was mad. I said, now, Professor, is that reasonable? I can't see, taste, touch, smell, hear, or detect your mind, but is that reasonable? He said, of course not. I said, I agree. If I follow your carcass around, I notice that your carcass creates order out of disorder. It can apply concepts to matter to produce machines. And it does all kinds of complex things which are obviously more likely the result of a mind. And so when it comes to the existence of God, we must apply the same principle. What is more reasonable? That information-packed, micro-miniaturized supermachines, which science tell us must be the result of a concept or a mind. These are the, are the, what's more reasonable? They're the result of chance or the result of a mind. I want to tell you a story about this mountain. I want to tell you a story about this mountain that I found in South Dakota. This mountain, Mount Rushmore, is the result of billions of years of wind and rain and lightning and snow and earthquakes and burrowing squirrels did this mountain, produce these four guys' faces up here. Isn't that incredible? Amazing, right? I did this presentation uh, a while back to some high school students, and there were a couple of kids in the back going, yeah, that's awesome, dude. Whoa. That is amazing. <laughs> now, Mount Rushmore. What do we see when we see Mount Rushmore? Well, what we see is an information storage system. We see the concept, information, the information concept of a human face is stored in rock. You can store information in anything. In this case, you've got a concept which is stored in rock. Now, to understand that this is the concept of four faces, you have to have the necessary machinery and the software to interpret it. In other words, you have to have a brain to interpret this as being information. Now, can we see the creator of Mount Rushmore? No. Is he hiding behind the rock, waving to us? No. What do we see? We see the handiwork of the creator. We see the handiwork or the fingerprints of the designer creator of Mount Rushmore. Now, could Mount Rushmore be the result of wind and rain and snow and lightning and squirrels? Well, I mean, if time equals infinity, you might argue that, you know, maybe. But I don't think so. Because to create Mount Rushmore, you'd have to have an error correction process. Because if you, you know, if a squirrel accidentally chips off, you know, Washington's nose, you'd have to put it back on, right? There's no error correction process in chance. And so we must ask the question, like with the existence of God, what is more plausible since we can't see or detect the creator of Mount Rushmore, what's more plausible? The Mount Rushmore is the result of a concept which was applied and stored in matter or the result of natural forces. Obviously, it's more likely that the Mount Rushmore was the result of a concept. And so it is with God. When we look at micro-miniaturized super machines, living cells, science tells us it must be the result of a concept.